This is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 38. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 38. I am Joe Chaffin. I'm happy once again to be your host. I really can't wait for you to hear this today's discussion, but first, let me clear something up. I, some have written and asked me about the Blood Bank Guy TransfusionNews.com collaboration. Well, it's really pretty simple right now. As of right now, our two completely independent sites are just linking to content on each other's page. So my some of my stuff is on their page, and their news updates and article summaries are on mine. It's really useful, and, and you can find lots of good stuff across both websites. But what I'm really excited about is that by the end of September 2017, we're going to be announcing a joint educational project that I am certain that you're going to love. So so stay tuned and you will hear more on this coming very, very soon. By the way, transfusionnews.com is made possible by support from Biorad Laboratories. Okay, so today I want to cover a topic that, that sometimes really seems really simple, but it has lots of nuance. And that topic is hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, which we affectionately call HDFN. I've been teaching for a lot of years and I've seen lots of people struggle with this concept, not just pathology residents. And my guest is eminently qualified to take us through this. He is Dr. Greg Denemy, and Greg is the Director of Tr Immunohematology and Transfusion Services at the Blood Center of Wisconsin. Uh, Greg is an, an amazingly accomplished blood banker. You can see the list of some of his accomplishments on the show page for this episode, which is bbguy.org slash 038. Strongly recommend that you go there and check that out. He's also the recipient of the 2017 AABB Sally Frank Memorial Award, which is a huge honor, and it's given for his lifelong achievements in the field. Uh, he's also very active on Twitter. You can find him at Greg Denemy, that's G-R-E-G, D-E-N-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. Greg is great, and I, I really can't wait for you to hear uh, everything that he has to share about HDFN. So no more waiting, right? Let's go. Here's my interview on HDFN with Greg Denemy. Hi, Greg. Welcome to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. Hi, Joe. Glad to be here. It's such an honor to have you here, and I don't want to go one more second without uh, without. I just told everyone about about you getting the the Sally Frank Award, and and I just think that is an amazingly cool honor. So so congratulations, man! I'm so happy for you. Well, thank you, thank you. It's uh, it, it's well deserved, I would say, and uh, and to that end, I, I'm always really interested in people's stories, and and you have, I think, a really cool story of of you know how you got involved in blood banking and and how you've gotten to the point where you are now you know as the winner of such a prestigious award would you mind just just giving us just a quick look um, a thumbnail if you will of, of what got you started in blood banking and and what's kind of kept your career going sure I'm I'm, I'm happy to do that um, it started quite a while ago I actually uh, in high school I worked in a, a hospital kitchen and would deliver food carts to uh, the floors walking by uh, pathology on, on the ground floor and uh, one evening when I was finished, I uh, uh, walked up to um, a guy at a microscope and I said, what are you looking at? And um, this guy was a microbiologist and he took the time to explain what he saw. I believe it was probably a gram negative or gram positive bacteria. He showed me uh, um, agar plates and that kind of thing. And, and I got interested in, um, in, uh, in lab. I was good in biology, good in chemistry. Uh, reasonably good in math, and uh, went into a lab program in, um, in the mid-70s. Uh, from there, I did an ART, a Canadian um, Advanced Certification in Transfusion Medicine. Worked for a while, then I decided to get a graduate degree in immunology. I did a couple of postdoc fellowships, and um, try as I may, I ended up back in transfusion service. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and learn how to write and communicate. Um, uh, from there, it just uh, it was just small steps. I just looked at the step in front of me. I never looked at right. the top of the uh, stairway. And mm -hmm. uh, it's um, just small steps. Uh, you win the race, and mm -hmm. um, uh, just a little bit of hard work, but it it all paid off. Well, the other thing is, if if you're really good at, at immunohematology or blood banking, just ask yourself: um, Were you good in, in microbiology, or the reverse? Uh -huh. um, I think time and time again, when I ask people, there seems to be a connection between being uh, really uh, good at at um, 
looking at bacteria and uh, deciding w what they are, naming them, what their antibiotic resistance is, and uh, the same kind of mental gymnastics goes on in immunohematology. <laughs> well, yeah, th there's a that's reason that theory. I'm laughing. No, there's yeah. a reason that I'm laughing, Greg, and that's that people that are long-term listeners of this podcast will know that I've said about 100 times how much I hate microbiology. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's my theory. I'm sticking with it. Okay, fair enough. There Maybe I'm the exception. I'll, uh, yeah. or, or maybe I'm a lousy blood banker. That's possible, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, well. Well, yeah. thank you for saying that. Well, right. you and I today are going to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics. I, I think it's endlessly fascinating. And, and we want to hit the, the essentials of, of hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, or HDFN, as it tends to be abbreviated. So, so Greg, why don't, you, why don't you start us off by just, uh, just for the, the, the learners out there that are just tr still trying to figure this whole thing out. When we say that, when we say hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, what are we talking about? What's the basic process that's going on? Well, what we're talking about is uh, an immune response in a woman who uh, has children. And uh, basically, uh, she produces um, an antibody that's directed to a fetal antigen. Um, it's expressed in utero. The antigens are expressed at delivery. Um, and uh, this antibody is directed to an antigen that's inherited from the father. Okay. And that just about... Um, uh, is it in a nutshell. The really important thing is it's all about IgG because IgM and IgA, uh, we know that there are different immunoglobulin classes mm -hmm. that are important in transfusion medicine, but only IgG crosses the placenta in this disorder and um, is really the, the pathophysiology uh, of the whole thing. So um, that is what hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn is. It, it used to be called just hemolytic disease of the newborn. Mm -hmm. And then we realized, well, well, we knew a long time ago that um, some of the disorders that looked very different were in fact the same disease. But we, it's a bit of a misnomer to leave out fetus. So if you look at the early uh, literature, it'll just say hemolytic disease, the newborn, sometimes PubMed. It doesn't have fetus uh, in the tagline. But um, we've been a little bit more specific about the actual disorder by including the word fetus and newborn. Okay, Greg. So uh, with that general outline in mind, maybe we can get a little bit more into the into the specifics of it. And uh, and I guess what I'm driving at is um, what I mean. What causes mom to to make these antibodies? Is there? I mean, are there certain antigens that are more likely to do this? Certain antibody antigens that are less likely to do this? What's kind of the process of mom doing this? Right. Well. Um the, the typical scenario is is uh, um, there's one pregnancy that's uneventful. And uh, it, there are some instances when that, that isn't the case. But by and large, um, a woman has a baby and at delivery there's a maternal fetal blood exchange. Okay. There is a short list of antigens that are uh, immunogenic enough that even a small amount of of um, neonatal or fetal blood can stimulate the mom to make an antibody. And as everyone has learned, this is typically an IgM that quickly converts to IgG. Mm -hmm. It might even disappear on the, uh, the first pregnancy. But what's really important is that at some point, IgG antibody is formed mm -hmm. uh, from her B cells. Uh, this antibody at the next pregnancy can cross the placenta. It binds to fetal red cells and the fetus starts to pr produce red cells around 15 weeks, 17 weeks of gestation, possibly a little earlier. Mm. Uh, but the antibodies bound to red cells. Mm -hmm. And then the fetal um, uh, reticuloendothelial system or monocytic, um, monocyte phagocytic system uh, uh, phagocytizes IgG-coated red cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, this results in anemia or... Um, maybe nothing at, at, during the pregnancy, but it can catch up and uh, these children can be born uh, slightly anemic. Um, don't forget that um, antibody in the, um, for instance, antibody in my blood system is, a, uh, there's about five liters of blood, but there's about 50 liters of interstitial fluid that I have. So mm. the antibody in the um, neonate's uh, blood system you can purge it, you could um, do an exchange, but it's just going to leak back out from the interstitial spaces. So it, it hangs around for 
upwards of weeks, depending on, on the, um, and can affect the, the child's hemoglobin for up, upwards of, of weeks. But that's it in, in, uh, okay. in sort of short term. She makes an antibody, mm -hmm. sort of one free pregnancy. Um, <laughs> then the next pregnancy, things go awry. You can detect it uh, early in, in gestation. There's a management plan, but it's really all about IgG crossing the placenta and causing FC-mediated uh, phagocytosis by the fetal uh, reticuloendothelial system. So two quick questions about that in terms of the IgG crossing. And we, we say that all the time, IgG crosses the placenta. I think it's maybe it's a little bit underappreciated by people learning about this, that, that that's, that's not really a passive process, right? Isn't it, it's, it's more of a, it's, it's an active grabbing IgG and bringing it across the placenta, right? Correct. Correct. Um, there is uh, a, an FC receptor that circulates in, in plasma called the neonatal FC receptor. Uh -huh. it, it, it kind of protects IgG from degradation. It hands, uh, sort of hands off the IgG to what's called the syncytia trophoblastic region. And this is where maternal blood literally is abutted up next to fetal blood mm -hmm. in this sort of um, amorphous syncytia trophoblastic area. And um, it's very unicellular. Uh, and IgG can be actively transported across this um, this membrane, so to speak, and uh, from the maternal circulation into the fetal circulation. Got it. And and the other thing I wanted to make sure that people were clear on, you mentioned that this type of hemolysis is not the classic hemolysis, intravascular ABO type hemolysis that we think about, where an antibody binds to a red cell, fixes complement, blows it apart. But this is this is more of an extravascular like thing where where the, the antibody is bound by the red cell and the spleen takes it out. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. There's there's a twist to it that we can discuss about anti-K uh, mm -hmm. later on. But um, by and large, it, it is um, uh, what we call extravascular red cell destruction. Got it. Okay. Well, good deal. So, so Greg, we've known about we've known about HDFN. It's not new. You mentioned it used to go by a different name with HDN, but uh, we've we've known about it for a long time. Has have there been? Uh, I don't know, maybe steps in the progression in, in the, the way that we've treated this and the way that we've managed it. Have, have we gotten better at it, I guess, over the years? Yeah, correct. Um, uh, one of my favorite publications is 1939. It's a fairly um, um, good example of, of um, hemolytic disease of the, of the fetus and newborn. And oddly enough, the father's blood was used to uh, transfuse to the, to the mother. I, I will have that in our, in our list at the end of, um, end of the podcast. But, uh -huh. but in, um, in, it was actually rather common, and uh, it, it has its own uh, designation as a, um, an entity causing death. It was so, so common in up, up to the 1940s and 50s. Mm -hmm. So, so actually, the deaths um, in a thousand live births was somewhere in the order of almost five percent until we found out and discovered what RHD was all about. Mm -hmm. And it took a, about ten years to do things like exchange transfusion on uh, delivery, mm -hmm. and then obstetricians got a little bit more um, aggressive. They would deliver uh, the, the 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 infant early. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things made uh, the deaths uh, due to a, a hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn go down. Um, monitoring the um, bilirubin, the OD450, um, helped reduce uh, deaths, as did interperitoneal transfusions, which mm -hmm. precedes uh, interuterine transfusion by cordocentesis. And, of course, everyone knows in um, the mid-60s, around six, 1965, 68, was the introduction of anti-D, and then we saw a rapid drop in the um, incidence of hemolytic disease in newborn due to anti-D. Mm -hmm. Um, ultrasound made us a little bit uh, better at predicting. And then uh, it continued to drop because of the introduction of antenatal um, prophylaxis as opposed to just postnatal. And then with ultrasound, things like inter intravenous uh, transfusion or cordocentesis and uh, transfusion directly, uh, it's, in a, it's an exchange transfusion interuterine. Uh, things like uh, fetal typing, so you can predict uh, the uh, disease and and Medial cerebral artery uh, Dopplers was, is uh, a surrogate marker of anemia, and when done serially, um, can predict um, uh, 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 the effect of HDN, and, and there can be some interventions early. All of this reduces uh, deaths due to this um, 
what what one time was a rather common uh, and horrible disease. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and I I think especially we in the blood bank side. Um, I, and I'm sp- I'm speaking for myself and and the 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 blood bank technologists that I've worked with, Greg. I'd love your perspective on this. In particular, what you were mentioning about about Doppler and and looking at the the flow and the uh, the blood flow in the middle cerebral artery with faster flow correlating to more anemia in the baby. I think that's from my perspective. Blood bank techs have a tendency to to uh, underestimate the effect that that's had because there, there, there's not as much of a need anymore to to do the the, the fancy cortocentesis and and you know the, the monitoring that that's more invasive amniocentesis even I think has been lessened by the the impact of that. What's your perspective on that? Exactly as you mentioned, uh, I set up a um, a, a fetal uh, genotyping program at uh, Mount Sinai in Toronto, mm-hmm. and that. Um, the frequency of, of getting amniotic fluid uh, derived DNA dropped dramatically once uh, Doppler testing became mainstream. So it would be much better to to have a non-invasive um, test than to go uh, something like uh, am- amniocentesis, um, risking a spike in titer, risking uh, preterm labor, that kind of thing. So it had a dramatic effect, and maybe people don't realize just how many titers we used to do prior to uh, to Doppler. It was uh, <laughs> right. It took up a significant portion of a few blood bank re- uh, freezers to keep the previous titer along with the current titer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Much. You're right. Much. Much. Much less common, and that's uh, a safer thing from the for the baby, obviously. And I right, I think that's right. that's a great thing. Okay. So we're going to get into this specifics of the antibodies that that cause that cause the problems here in just a second Greg but I wondered if you, if you could kind of just give us an overall outlook for for when when a mom has uh, or excuse me when the setup is right for HDFN is the, is there any way to kind of get an estimate for what proportion of babies do well do poorly etc uh well certainly the 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 the, the course uh, if just left on its own about half of of the um, of uh, women with a, a positive antibody screen to an antibody causing HDFN. Half of these babies are going to be delivered at term. It'll be relatively uneventful. They'll have mild uh, anemia, mild hemolytic disease. They're likely treated with um, um, the, um, the light, um, the billy light. They'll be monitored for their bilirubin, might stay in the hospital a few extra days, but essentially uneventful. A quarter of them will be anemic at delivery, and this is um, uh, something that becomes exceedingly important. So uh, you, what you want is um, babies born with lots of um, uh, hemoglobin and be able to exchange oxygen. They're just converting from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. Don't forget, um, fetal hemoglobin doesn't let go oxygen quite as well as, as adults. So anything like anemia, they, they do suffer. So Um, If they're anemic, they're going to require transfusions. It'll either be uh, top-up transfusions. If it's um, moderately significant, it'll be an exchange transfusion. And this all depends on how fast the uh, bilirubin is climbing up. And um, there are ways that decisions are made whether a top-up or an exchange is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And then a quarter of of, uh, HDFN are, are extremely severe. Um, they, for uh, a healthy uh, newborn to be delivered, uh, they will require intrauterine transfusions. Um, typically, there'll be an early delivery and um, even um, exchange transfusions on delivery, but certainly additional um, adult uh, allogeneic transfusions to support the infant uh, after they're born. Okay, okay. So so let's, uh, let's head on into the, the this the specific antigens and antibodies involved, Greg. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll open the door wide open to to however you want to approach this. What what right. antibodies and antigens should we be worrying about? Well, um, surprisingly, uh, anti D is still the most common. It, it's in the order of of almost half of all uh, HDFN cases. The next one, it turns out, is is anti K. Uh, when speaking to obstetricians, we'll just get this out of the way. We're going to mm-hmm. use the word Cal, anti-Cal, and Cal positive. Uh, I'm used to it. Um, maybe uh, other people, um, they kind of stumble. But obstetricians still call it Cal, even though it's the Cal blood group system. So yeah, so it's the next most common. And then Rh little c and big E or Rh big C. Um, 
is somewhat less than anti-K in the order of 10 or 15 percent. And then we have the, the stragglers, Duffy A, um, Kid, Big S, occasionally N. Um, and then we get into some of the really rare ones like antigens that are what are called low prevalence antigens that are immunogenic. So the father has, so for example, has, is positive for the Miltenberger MIA. Um, this stimulates anti-MIA in the mom. Or the reverse, where the mother's unusually is negative for uh, a high prevalence antigen, and then there's a lot of a, a lot of consternation because um, virtually something like an anti-RH17, it's really hard to find compatible blood. And maybe we can talk a little bit later, but but the mom is always um, walking around as a compatible donor. Don't forget, um, it's not the the person you want to use if you don't have to. Um, but if push comes to shove. Don't forget, she's always compatible with her, her serum. That's a good um, point. As for ABO, I didn't mention ABO for a reason. I, I think we could take this um, a little bit later or, or now if you like. Yeah, ABO let's do it now. Hemo okay, ABO hemolytic disease is, is really uncommon. Um, what, what I like to, um, to refer to ABO as an ABO maternal fetal incompatibility. So think of it this way. Um, it, you accidentally pick, you, you open the fridge door and you randomly pick a unit out of the fridge and you want to send it to the OR. What's the chance that it's going to be compatible? Well, it turns out it's 17%. It's not something you want to do for a living. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is with um, mother and father. 17% of the time, they're compatible. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of maternal and fetal ABO incompatibilities. If the mom's O and the baby's A, Mm -hmm. um, these babies can be born term with a positive DAT that might be weak or one plus. Um, the mother's antibody screen is invariably negative, right? Mm -hmm. For uh, it's done with group O reagent red cells. Uh, you do a, an, an elution. Um, typically, it's a Louis Freeze thaw, thinking it's an ABO antibody. Mm -hmm. Test against the screen cells, A1 cells, and a and B, if the, if the infant is A, um, you'll demonstrate that you've eluded anti-A. This is not really hemolytic disease of the newborn. This is a maternal fetal incompatibility. Um, the, 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 the neonatal ward needs to know. Um, they might be tracking the fetus, the infant's um, bilirubin. And again, a bilirubin might be in order. Um, but surprisingly, you get almost as many children born that have to go under the bilirubin and they're group O. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this thing where, where kids are born, their liver isn't quite mature enough to handle um, all that uh, happens at birth. And so their bilirubin rises just on their own. And uh, so it's really hard to delineate ABO, HDFN, from these also these other um, cases where the bilirubin rises. So we, we tend to describe those as ABO maternal fetal incompatibility. Yeah. If it involved um, uh, a tr a tr um, exchange transfusion or uh, the anti-A titer was one in 2048, now you're talking ABO. Mm -hmm. but, but by and large, uh, don't forget, babies are born. They have a poor expression of A and B. They're, they likely look A2. They've got a lot of A substance in their plasma. So, so all of this um, it really works against having ABO as a hemolytic disease of the newborn. It's likely um, ABO maternal fetal incompatibility, and that's it. I think that's a I think that's a good way to, to look at it, Greg. I will admit that that, that when I when when I am teaching pathology residents in in uh, board reviews, I have said in the past uh, that ABO is the is the most common HDFN. But I think the way that you put it is a better way to look at it. The ABO incompatibility is obviously very common, but I I always say to those residents, actual hemolysis that leads to significant consequences is is really 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 uncommon in those scenarios. So I think we're kind of saying the same thing, maybe yep. semantically slightly different, but but right. I think we're on the same page. So I, I wanted to go back to something that you said just a minute ago, because I think this is important for people to understand. And you you mentioned that that roughly half of, uh, of the cases of HDFN involve anti-D. Well, I guess my question for you is, why? I mean, my goodness, we've made such a, it's been such a point of emphasis uh, all around the world to try and prevent this. Why does it still happen? Well, um, 
it is it's a really good question i i don't have anything um specific i i have some some more or less observational comments one one is um the rh immune globulin has to be given correctly mm. and um there there are two forms one is is uh, iv it's prepared and can be given intravenously the other is is intramuscularly, and um, there have been publications on its improper uh, administration, in, depending on how much fat tissue is around is at the site. So that that's the first one. Maybe it's not given correctly. Okay. Uh, the second is, and this was more observational in my days in Toronto, is that uh, women would have an anti-D. They they got Rh immune globulin. They're certain of it. There's documentation of it. Um, a few cases that we had, one woman, um, she, she was playing baseball in her second trimester. She fell. She went to the hospital. Everyone was okay. Fetus is fine. And then she has an anti-D uh, at the end of her pregnancy. Oh, wow. A couple of um, uh, women show up and emerge, and uh, because they're pregnant, they would go to our institution. They were in a car accident. You know, you're wearing a seat belt, and everything's okay, but... We checked for a fetal bleed. It didn't seem to happen, but maybe there was a blood exchange that was just that was missed. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 so those are kind of events that are, are sort of traumatic events. And I think um, what we're also seeing is is um, people that are getting uh, a health care that didn't in the past um, mm -hmm. through uh, they just arrived um, to the country. They um, didn't take care of themselves. Um, there is a, if they're not taken care of properly, they're going to make anti-D. This occurs about 10 to 12% after the first pregnancy and then goes up with each additional exposure at delivery of a maternal fetal blood exchange. Um, I think that about covers everything that you, you think, well, um, and anti-D or the RH antigen, the RHD antigen is the most immunogenic antigen that there is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in the minor blood group systems. So it doesn't take a lot. The difference between RHD and RHCE is somewhere in the order of 34 amino acids. So it is very immunogenic, and I think that's what we're seeing. When you look at anti-K, it's second in line. Um, and some of the studies in transfusion medicine related to transfusion put uh, the K antigen as the number one immunogenic antigen after RHD because we give ABORH compatible blood. Right. We say that K is quite immunogenic. But I think what we're seeing is just some uh, lack of proper health care, uh, some maybe traumatic events that, that as much as we try real hard to make sure everyone's okay and there's no fetal bleed, it still happens. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are maternal fetal uh, blood exchanges prior to the, the time that antenatal RHD is given, and so they've already made the anti-D. Got it. Got it. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's a combination of multiple possible factors, including I, I love what you said there. I mean, we're, we're fighting against something that's that's really, really immunogenic to start with. So it, we're a little bit behind the eight ball to begin with. And then all the other factors that could play into it. I, I hear you. So thanks for clarifying that, Greg. So let's let's move on and talk a little bit about a couple of things that that we have in our toolbox. Um, once we once we find someone that that, that is a mom that is potentially set up um, with uh, with the possibility for HDFN, say for example, she comes in for her prenatal testing and we find an antibody and there's concern. There's a couple things that I that I know you like to to mention in terms of, and I know are near and dear to your heart, given your uh, uh, your passions and the stuff that you've done in your career that includes both testing the dad paternal testing and testing the fetus in terms of uh, fetal genotyping so why don't you why don't you start off with testing dad and and talk to us about your feelings about that right well um, so key to the uh, to the management of um, the pregnancy is knowing whether the dad is uh, homozygous or heterozygous for the uh, the antigen of interest mm-hmm and um, we're good to go on a phenotype basis. So we have FDA-licensed reagents. Um, if, if a woman had an anti-Duffy A, it's, ex it's very easy to determine uh, what's expressed on the red cells. Uh, Duffy A positive, B positive. Mm -hmm. He's heterozygous. Duffy A pos, B neg. Well, there's a little bit of a twist. Um, but also for um, big K and little K, big uh, big E, little E, etc. The real troublesome one is RHD. Um, we don't have a test where 
uh, a phenotyping test where we have um, uh, knowing the father's zygosity. And wh what I've done is I, I show um, examples. If you have that little slide uh, um, cheat, yeah. cheat slider, um, uh -huh. if you just have um, Rh positive for all of the common antigens in, in Caucasians, your R1, R2 is, is 12%, but R1 mm -hmm. little r double prime is 1%. Mm -hmm. So basically there's a 10% chance that you think the father's homozygous, the obstetrician mm -hmm. would say, well, um, this means the baby did inherit the antigen, um, but you have a 10 per, 1 in 10 chance you're wrong, 1 in 12, 1 in 10. So I, that's uh, playing with fire a little bit. So Greg, for let me inter let me interrupt you for just one second, and I just want to make this really really clear for the for the ones that are just starting and and learning here. So you say that there's that we don't have we don't have a test to that a serologic test that definitively proves zygosity, and I'm completely agreeing. But let's just let's just make sure that people understand the difference, and and I think that's partly you mentioned with big C little C. There's two different two different antigens, obviously, but with big D, there's no even though people read little D, there's no actual little d antigen, right? Correct, correct. There's there's no little d, and and d typing is going to be four plus whether they have two copies or one copy. Right. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying so, that. So so when we yeah that that's that uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. So when we have these uh, complete Rh phenotype, we can turn to what are called most probable genotype tables, uh -huh. and and I just demonstrate that that these tables have some blind spots in them. Um, for Caucasians, it's a 1 in 12 chance that you're wrong. When um, you have the um, D positive and, and positive only for little c and little e, you're either RO, RO, or you're RO, little r. And uh, people of West African heritage have a 50-50 chance. They're equally uh, prevalent in the population, 25% each. So it's a coin toss. In, in RHD, what would be much better is to determine zygosity at the DNA level for uh, the father. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in my experience uh, at a um, obstetrical maternal fetal program, uh, 8, 10%, maybe a little higher, um, they really don't know who the father is. This is just, uh, just the reality. Yep. So most of the time, they should know who the father is. And... Um, Zygosity is easy to determine using a, a DNA toolbox uh, just to figure out how many copies of RHD are at the um, RH locus in chromosome 1 at the end of P, the P arm. Um, there's two ways you can ask are there, more, are there one or two copies of RHD or the region around RHD when it's deleted it has a configuration that you know the D gene has been deleted it, these are high, these are rhesus boxes that flank the RHD, and when it's gone, you have a hybrid rhesus box. Some people look for this rhesus hybrid rhesus box, and and therefore conclude that the father is uh, heterozygous. Now, now the real term for this, in and I was corrected some years ago. The real term for this by geneticists is that you're hemizygous, because you're you really don't have big D and little D. You just have mm -hmm. one copy of RHD. So you might see right. in the literature. Hemizygous, but the way to do this is by um, a DNA test for zygosity. The tables are fine, but there are some blind spots. Okay. How re how readily available in 2017 is uh, is that kind of DNA testing, Greg? Uh, it, it's probably a, a referred out uh, test to uh, maybe a handful to a dozen um, either um, genetic centers or mm -hmm. um, IRL reference labs. Relatively common, but it would likely be a send out. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you mentioned something really important there that, um, and, and this is, I will admit, this is something I've always had concerns about with testing dad, because we know mom is mom, or we think mom is mom. We don't always know dad is dad. And you, you mentioned that there are some social issues involved there that we won't go into any further. But if that, so if that's not available, or sometimes even if that is available and the, the, the father is hemizygous, where does fetal testing come into all that? Well, um, if if uh, so, with with the father being tested and he is homozygous and he the, the, he truly is the father, which is mm -hmm. a discussion that's that's had, um, <laughs> right. then there is no need for inter, um, invasive testing of the fetus. Um, uh, there may be a conversation, and we see these kinds of tests being done 
uh, but an amniocentesis if the father's homozygous is, is likely um, unnecessary. It's when he's heterozygous, and there are other, other um, reasons that uh, the obstetrician gets to a point where they feel they have to know the, uh, the actual antigen status of the fetus. And this is done by um, uh, essentially an amniocentesis. Um, in chemistry, they, they want the fluid, they spin the sample, and there's a cell pellet, which years ago they would throw out, and now that's used to obtain fetal, uh, fetal DNA. And it's easy to determine all of the blood group antigens that are involved in, in uh, HDFN, the common ones. It's very easy to determine them using a DNA test. Mm -hmm. What we can also do is, um, well, we can ask the question, let's say the fetus is, in, the, in a case of anti-D, is, is Rh negative. The very first case I ever had, I was I was asked, well, we don't. Maybe you just tested the mom. You don't know that's uh, <laughs> amniotic fluid derived DNA. I'd uh -huh. like to think it is. So what uh -huh. would you do? And um, now what we do is essentially what's called uh, DNA fingerprinting. We look at uh, what are called variable number of tandem repeats, and we can tell that the fetus has inherited a repeat that the mother doesn't have, and therefore mm -hmm. we were handling non maternal DNA. So a negative result must be accurate. Nice, nice. That's that's cool. I, it, yeah, it's, yeah. It's gone. It's gone well beyond uh, what what used to be available. And it, so you guys are doing really fascinating things. <laughs> uh, anything more on that on on fetal genotyping before we move on a little bit? Because I, I want to come back to the to the anti big K thing in just a second. But right. anything more on fetal genotyping? No, I think that's it. I think that's okay. It. All right, good deal. So, um, given given all that, Greg, I want to circle back around um, because we've we've kind of talked through. Um, Kind of how to approach these and uh, and and looking at looking at uh, you know looking at dad uh, if necessary looking at the baby and um, you know m guiding the management in that way. But I, I you talked about anti big K before and I I think that's such an important thing because I think it's widely misunderstood among clinicians and in some cases among laboratorians. So so let's go back to that. L let's just compare the anti D that or sorry the uh, HDFN that's caused by an antibody like an anti-RHD versus uh, the issues that come from an anti-Big K and, and help us understand what the differences are. Okay. Um, well, uh, there's some things going on in the um, in fetal development that impinge on HDFN when it's, it's anti-K. There, there may be some other um, blood group systems, but we, um, we don't really know too much uh, but we've done well with um, with anti case. So here's here's what happens is um, let's say for example you find either an anti D or an anti K at, at 12 weeks gestation, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. um, woman's got the father is um, K positive or D positive. There's a history of HDFN. Um, the outcome of previous pregnancies wasn't well. Titers are high. They're monitoring with ultrasound, MCA, Doppler, serial Dopplers are being done. Um, what's going on in this case? So you know it's 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 going to get bad. Um, well, really, what's happening is antibodies crossing the placenta and it's floating around the fetal system. But at around 15, 17 weeks gestation, there's a significant amount of blood. But there's something unusual. The Kell glycoprotein is expressed very early in red cell ontogeny, mm -hmm. whereas the RHD is not. Mm -hmm. So right away, what I would think is if, if it's on the cell and it's an early erythroid progenitor cell, the antibody is going to bind. Mm -hmm. So now what it's going to do is if there is a functional um, spleen and liver, this, these um, antibody-sensitized red cells are going to be removed by macrophages. So you've got early um, red cell destruction. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Jeff Daniels showed that. Um, in a study where he took cord blood and he looked at K expression and he looked mm -hmm. at um, RHD expression and cord blood. It's easy to, to see whether someone is big K positive or RHD positive. But if you grow um, CD34 cells in culture, there's a way to do this. And you just grow them up for, in, in this case, it, it's, it's about a week. And you ask the question, I have some erythroid progenitor cells. If you look at them, they're nucleated. Um, the pathologist could even stain them and say these are um, 
orthochromoblasts, that kind of thing, they express the Kel antigen, glycoprotein, but they don't express D. So uh -huh. we know that that if it's expressed, it's the antibody is going to bind, and then there's going to be early red cell destruction. The second thing that happens is um, when these antibodies to the Kel glycoprotein bind, for reasons I don't fully understand, is one thing that happens is the mitochondria in the red cell will depolarize, which really means they, they don't produce energy. And um, Vaughn in New England Journal of Medicine showed that in these same cultures that, that Jeff Daniels worked with, in these same cultures, you could have uh, an antibody, Kel antibody, if the, if the, core, if the progenitor cells are K positive, um, they're, they're inhibited from growing whereas if they're K-negative or Kel-negative, they grow just fine. So we know there's a suppressive effect. So there's two things going on that doesn't happen with RHD. So there's in RHD, there's extravascular hemolysis during fetal development. It starts at around 20 weeks. It gets worse before it gets better. Um, you try to get uh, a delivery of a, of, a, of a viable and healthy infant to the best you can. With anti-K, they're suppressing, it's the anti-K is suppressing erythropoiesis, that causes anemia. The red cells that are produced are, are have the Kel glycoprotein expressed early, so they're destroyed early. And, and that actually can fool us because an amniocentesis, if you looked at the bilirubin, the OD450, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like things are all that bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of this adds up that um, it's just a, it's, it's worse for anti-K than it is for all of the other, um, the common antigens that we know in HDFN. So, I mean, is it, is it fair to say that, that uh, perhaps with this scenario with anti-Big K that, that HDFN is a little bit of a misnomer? Because it's kind of like, it's, it's anemia without necessarily this substantial amount of hemolysis that we're talking about, right? Well, that's correct. And, and um, they're presentation in, in severe disease is um, is is more like uh, they just have no uh, appreciable red cells in, in severe disease they they it 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 isn't red cell destruction it's 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 largely um, uh, preventing them from uh, from growing Mm -hmm. And one other question about that, Greg, uh, we, we've talked a little bit about titers before, and, uh, and I think most everyone is aware that, for example, the classic example with anti-D, that as the titer gets higher above a certain critical threshold, however that's defined, there's, there's a, lot more, uh, a lot more significance, and maybe you could address that threshold as well. But with it, does, the, does the titer matter as much with anti-Big K? Um, probably not as much. Um, typical titers that are uh, critical titers or threshold titers are either 16 or, or 32. This is what I, I see in the, in the literature. With anti-K, mm -hmm. all bets are off. Right. Um, a titer of 8 may be, um, and the, the maternal history, um, it may be deemed um, that they're watched very carefully, that there might be some sort of invasive intervention to make sure that the, the, the fetus is okay. But definitely the uh, a, a lower threshold for the titer is in order with, uh, with anti-K. The other thing I'd like to add is, is that um, uh, along with uh, the trouble getting to a, um, a safe uh, gestational age to deliver a, a healthy baby is post-delivery, um, don't drop your guard. Uh, mm. the, the pediatric involvement is, I think, is important for any HDFN. But with Kel and all of this, and you know, remember we mentioned we talked about antibody being in the interstitial space. This anti-Kel will continue to suppress erythropoiesis at delivery. These babies with anti-Kel tend to have no retics, and this really is the canary in the mine shaft. Yeah. That the pediatrician should be um, alerted that there are no retics. Check next week or the week after, whatever is appropriate. Mm -hmm. But um, George Garrity and, and I talked about this uh, weeks after they can have what's called late onset anemia. And we also described this in, a, in a, one of the rare antibodies, the anti garbage 3. So uh, it is one other antibody that suppresses erythropoiesis, um, but you don't see it all that often. Right. Uh, but um, all these, these babies with anti-K, they have to be followed carefully. Um, 
so that um, uh, anemia is setting in in two or three weeks, you can catch it with a top up. That's a great point. That's a great point. Okay, well, let's move on a little bit to uh, to close this part of the discussion with. Um, let's be pre- be real practical. You, you've we've already talked about a lot of the testing that the laboratory does, uh, but what should a transfusion service potentially be prepared for in terms of in terms of their role, not just with testing, but in terms of potentially having to provide products for babies that are affected. Uh, right. Well, um, so what typically would happen for the transfusion service, there would be a request for, uh, in severe disease, there would be a request for uh, blood be made available for intrauterine transfusion. It will typically be O negative, mm-hmm. it'd be K negative, uh, C negative, E negative, and anti-CMV non-reactive. Mm-hmm. And before it goes out the door, it's likely irradiated. So it's a tall order. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, the the goal is that this blood, if you're going to do an intrauterine transfusion, you'd like it to be as fresh as possible. So things like less than 10 days old, less than seven days old might mm-hmm. be a request. Anything more uh, fresher than that is going to be a challenge to, to produce, typically less than seven days old. Um, it would be nice to, to uh, commit one unit as we do with neonates, mm-hmm. but that unit will be aging as uh, the woman uh, goes along her pregnancy. So now the, you, you don't want to transfuse older blood. It's going to mean you'll have to transfuse more often. So we tend to then have uh, the same request if it's a couple of weeks down the road or, or a month down the road. It would still be a fresher, a fresh unit, less than 10 days old. Mm-hmm. Um, um, O-neg, K-neg, E-neg, C-neg, anti-CMV non-reactive. Um, and then uh, the blood bank may have to provide, in some instances, they're, they're given the gestational age, and from that, the, the um, fetal placental blood volume can be determined. And then there are tables that can be created in which you can determine just how much blood to give the fetus. And this is done in a procedure room. The blood banks sometimes are asked to check that the blood taken out, there's a small amount of blood taken out at the start. Is this fetal? Are we in the right um, vein? And that's a, a weak uh, solution, a 0.1 normal sodium hydroxide. And uh, you can determine fetal DNA, uh, fetal uh, blood from adult blood. Adult blood uh, looks more cyan in its color. Fetal blood will remain a bright red. So there might be a role for the blood bank uh, to do that or the transfusion service. And the hemo cue that's used for those people who donate blood, you see your blood, uh, your hemoglobin taken. That's also uh, in the procedure room. So um, it's providing blood, how much blood, and uh, antigen negative. Right. Now, the, the, the trick is uh, if, if it's an antibody to a high prevalence antigen, you might have to get the American Rare Donor Program involved. Mm-hmm. Um, it just might not be possible. Um, and I, I think we just mentioned it briefly in the earlier in the podcast, but the, the woman herself is always antigen compatible. Now, um, from my experience, these women would walk on broken glass if they had, <laughs> you know, they are just so committed. But it is it is a logistics uh, difficulty. They're already um, challenged to maintain their hemoglobin. So to mm-hmm. take blood from them, give it to the fetus, and give back what you don't use, and do it again in a two weeks later, it is a little bit of um, a real gymnastics. Um, exercise. Uh, If you can get through that pregnancy, the woman should be donating blood autologously for herself and for next pregnancies. They do this without fail, Um, but that goes into the hopper along with um, the management of the infant after uh, after birth if it's um, an antibody to a high prevalence antigen. Okay. Well, Greg, I think that's that's a lot of really, really useful and information and I, I would like to I would like to close our time together with uh, with just a, a few kind of quick hitters uh, if you don't mind I, I'm gonna pepper you with stuff and and just kind of just real quick uh, answers on on how you would approach these things because I want to get real practical with this for for people that All are, right, I'm, that I'm are ready. learning. You ready? Okay, here we go. Yep. Okay, let's just imagine that uh, that a mom comes in uh, for her twenty eight week twenty eight week visit, and you find that her antibody screen is positive, and what is identified is a very clear cut anti Lewis A. What are your thoughts, and how do you approach it? 
Um, well, it, you probably jumped through some hoops to get that anti-Lewis A identified. So she's still <laughs> right. waiting for Rh immune globulin. Get that down there and give it to her. Don't mm -hmm. don't delay. In terms of the anti-Lewis A, it, it's uh, rare that it causes um, hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. If you really wanted to. Um, 2ME treatment of the serum, and is there an IgG component? I wouldn't mm -hmm. do that for Lewis A. Okay, okay. So I, I guess the, the take-home is if it's something that's it, that clearly is not going to cause a problem for the baby. And I think, if I remember right, Greg, isn't Lewis, Lewis antibodies are not well expressed on fetal red cells well, anyway, right. right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so those probably not don't need to expend a ton of effort. Okay, number two, you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, here we go. So uh, a, a thirty-two thir a mom is thirty-two weeks uh, pregnant. She's Rh negative. She she has an unclear history because she's just moved from another state, and she visits her new obstetrician who says, "Well, I don't really know what's happened before, so I'm going to draw an antibody screen." And they send it to you, and they, and you find out that uh, that there is an anti D on that anab antibody screen. She's a really poor historian. What kind of thoughts are running through your head? Uh, well, if the anti-D titer is four or mm -hmm. something like that, and um, there's a likelihood she got Rh immune globulin at 28 weeks, mm -hmm. uh, well, the good news is it's four, so little should happen. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I I think should happen is is does she have an anti at anti-D at delivery? Is the infant Rh positive? Give Rh immune globulin because you don't mm -hmm. know whether the anti-D was real or Rh immune globulin back 32 weeks, mm -hmm. um, and then six months later, a follow-up, does she have anti-D? Anti-D hangs around uh, forever. Once you make mm -hmm. it, it's really easy to determine. It's very seldom does it, it wane or, or evanesce, as we say. Mm -hmm. So so give it six months. If she doesn't have an anti-D then, I think she's. It, it's a good sign that um, it's unlikely her anti-D that it was Rh and Blob. So I've I've heard people talk in that setting, Greg, and I just I'm interested in your thoughts on this um, about testing her at maybe testing her at that point first treating her serum with DTT to kind of denature IgM antibodies as a way to distinguish between her own anti D and RHIG, which is all Ig IgG. Any any thoughts on that? Um, well, if there is an IgM component, you're right. I, I think that would be the uh, um uh, one mark that it's her anti-D. Um, mm -hmm. Rh immune globulin is e essentially IgG. There's very little IgM in it. Um, you, the other thing that people don't know is RHIG, at least uh, the commonest uh, form that's given, is largely IgG1. So mm. some people say, well, maybe uh, the subclass can tell us. It's hard to do subclass. We, we uh, tend not to do this. I don't know too many people that would use that mm -hmm. to determine whether it's um, RH immune globulin or real anti-D. But yes, the, the IgM component would be um, uh, a signal that this is her anti-D. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's let's move on to the next one, and I I think this next one is really important because I, I know pathology residents have a lot of trouble with this one. Let's just say that a baby is born um, to a mom who has a completely negative antibody screen, but the baby is showing all kinds of signs of of HDFN. The bilirubin's going up. The the baby's anemic. Uh, the uh, the DAT, let's say, let's leave the DAT alone for now. But mm -hmm. um, in that setting, HDFN with a negative antibody screen, what thoughts should be running through our heads? Um, well, if um, if someone calls and says, "Is this HDFN?" and uh, the someone quickly looks up and says, "The mom's antibody screen. She she was uh, admitted uh, yesterday. We got that done. It's negative. It's negative. This is a little bit need to be a little bit careful." Mm -hmm. um, what I would do is, is I would quickly um, ask for um, the uh, ethnicity of, of the mom and the dad. Uh, I'd start thinking about uh, low-frequency antigens. If you can't get an ethnicity, there is a, there is a, um, a group of low-frequency antigens that can be tested um, to see if she has an antibody to um, of one of those. This, this can... Um, this could pop up at, at uh, any time during the pregnancy. She comes in, her baby's not moving. The obstetrician's worried. The antibody sure. screen is negative. Always, always get the ethnicity if possible. You could go after low-frequency antigens. There's a short list, and mm -hmm. um, blood banks have these. The other, if, if it really push comes to shove, is to 
take the mother's serum and test it against the father's red cells. Now, this can mm. be difficult if the father is um, A or B, um, but there's ways to absorb out anti-A and anti-B efficiently that you could get this done. It, it's a little bit tricky. Um, most labs wouldn't be able to do that. It might be a send-out. Um, but those two alone, I, I think uh, we can't forget that, um, for instance, people from Southeast Asia, anti-MIA is relatively common. I think it's in the order of 5% um, from transfusion and in pregnancy. So uh, do we have MIA positive cells in our screening cells here? No, we don't. So right. um, you could, you could um, argue anti-CW, um, um, mm -hmm. and there's a short list that people sure. can refer to. But those two, if you really have to get the father's red cells and um, try to do the absorptions efficiently and look whether the mom has an antibody to the father's red cells. This is how some of these low prevalence antigens have been discovered. Well, and, and there is one last thing, again, is uh, don't forget if the mom's screen is negative, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, is that uh, it could be maternal fetal incompatibility. Um, but if the baby is um, affected and there is hemolysis and, and some very big concerns about um, the bilirubin, uh, an ABO titer from the mom, if she's got uh, a titer of, you know, high titer of one in 2048 or, or much higher, mm -hmm. um, or you're seeing actually um, hemolysis in the lower dilutions of the titer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, a neat, one and two, one and four are hemolyzed. This is a, an anti, say for example, an anti, a hemolysin anti-A or anti-B. They're particularly aggressive. Got it. And so this would also be um, a possibility. Uh, that would be real ABO, F H F H right. <laughs> The real one, exactly. The real one, yeah. Uh, well, so Greg, the, the last thing I want to give you the opportunity to talk about is something that I know you feel pretty strongly about, and that's, um, you, you've mentioned to me before, in settings where where you have a mom who has an anti-D that's low titer, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how I've heard you put it, but you've said something along the lines of don't don't get too crazy with that. Don't get too busy with it. With someone with a low titer, you can almost kind of leave them alone. You want to close right. with a little thought on that? Yeah, yes. Um, so um, the obstetricians see these, uh, these cases a lot, and we know a lot about anti-DHDFN. And, and there is a critical titer. It may differ between institutions by a small amount. With Doppler and the things that, that they do in obstetrics, um, the best obstetrician, this is what I heard at fetal rounds many, many times, the best obstetricians are those that sit on their hands. Mm. Uh, because um, to do amniocentesis, uh, if the father is homozygous for RHD to do an amniocentesis, just to figure out, is the infant really RH positive, um, may be a, a bit excessive because there's a 3% chance that you can actually boost the antibody or end up with another antibody. These are the statistics from many years of doing amniocentesis in the setting of HDFN. So that 3%, they, need, they often weigh that over whether or not they should intervene at all. And I hear time and time again, just sit on your hands, just watch her carefully. And a titer of four, um, and there's the baby's moving, and, and ultrasound and Dopplers are fine. I wouldn't think that there needs to be any um, um, invasive intervention. All right, Greg. I I know that there's more that we could that we could talk about, um, and uh, you know things like what to do with anti G, which th there's some information on my website about that. But but quite frankly, let's. I think I think we should stop here. This has been really, I think, enormously helpful to to the people that are going to be listening. So thank you so much for hanging out with me and talking about HDFN. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, it's Joe with a couple of closing thoughts. Just a reminder, you can go to bbguy.org slash 038 for notes and some slides illustrating Dr. Denemy's points. And, and this is kind of new, some quiz questions that I've prepared to help solidify your learning on this really, really important topic. So my thanks to Dr. Greg Denemy for appearing on the podcast. Thanks to each of you for listening and for your feedback. Next time you're on a computer, please open iTunes, give this podcast a rating, give it a review. And when you're on the show page, bbguy.org slash 038, please don't hesitate to send a comment. I interact with people all the time through the comments and I do read every single one that comes in. So that is it for today. Thanks once again and as we close, I'll just remind you one more time, 
I hope that as you go through your day that you'll smile, that you'll have fun, and above all, never ever stop learning. Thanks a lot. Catch you next time on the podcast. <laughs>